gap through the middle in case anyone needs to get through whilst we're here. Sweet, sweet. This tight little laneway here is known as the Suez Canal. Literally a play on the word sewer. Because before the 1850s, there was no plumbed sewage or drainage around here. So people would throw all their rubbish and sewage out of the window. So it was a steep, rocky headland, and it'd run down, bank up against the houses in front, seeping underneath. It's all kind of gross. When it rained, this ran like a sewer. There was an expression at the time that the rocks could be heard one mile out to sea and smelt two miles out to sea. But it was also a fairly foolish person who'd wander into the laneway because it was the haunt of a gang known as the Rocks Push. That's what the shadowy characters along the walls are meant to represent. It's the ladies of the gang standing the entry to the laneway, trying to entice men in, maybe show off a bit of skin they weren't meant to, like their ankles. Once they'd managed to entice the victim into the laneway, the men of the gang had come out of the shadows, beat them up, steal all their money, steal their gold teeth if they had any, and just leave them bruised and battered on the floor. So thankfully it's a lot safer to wander through here these days. We can continue. Around.
Again, we'll leave a little gap just in case anyone needs to get through. So, so this big hole in the ground is known as the Argyle Cut, and it was originally part of the rocky headland, which made up the rocks. But the people who lived on the other side of the headland, worked on this side, didn't like the fact they had to climb up and over the headland, and all the way around the front, just to travel such a short distance. So they petitioned to the government and said, hey guys, can you do something about this to help us out? So in 1843, the government agreed. They got together a large number of convicts, chained them together, gave them pickaxes, and threatened them with whippings and beatings and set them to work on the hillside here. As you can see, it's a huge hole in the ground. No matter how much they whipped or beat these convicts, they couldn't do it, it was too much work. So 15 years later, the government said, okay, wait, we should do it properly this time. So they got together a large amount of explosives, blew it all out, cleared it out, and finally connected the two sides of the headland. The more commercial, touristy side, it's the more residential, historical side, which you get to see, but there are a few things you see this way first. So, here you can see these four little terrace houses are known as Susanna Place. They're some of our best surviving examples of workers' housing from around the rocks. They all date back to 1844. They were built by an Irish family who immigrated out here. They built all four of them, lived in the one on the corner, set it up as a little corner shop, still set up as an old school corner shop to this date, which I think is cool. They then rented out the other three for 26 pounds a year. Yeah, I wish I was paying that rent. <laughs> Apparently that was expensive at the time. It was generally only tradespeople who could afford to live there. But they're also notable for the fact they've been lived in by working class people since they were built right through until the 1970s. So they have this interesting layering of different histories, which uh, if you're interested in that sort of thing, they keep them all as a museum to that fact these days. They do tours through them, but just on Thursdays and Fridays. From here, you can head around to the big dig. Uh, no, we'll be gone. There's no one of us. Do you want to lift that? No. Oh, there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
can't yeah. be back, right? Oh, okay. my friend told me that he can't be back. Okay. He's, a, he's, he's here or he's in the US? He's in, in the US. Yes. Because most mm -hmm. the people they come from here. Yeah. 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 She said to me that she didn't have a package. Yeah. She was in the middle of her PhD when she was. So, we've come into this area that's more like something you might find in Rome or Europe, except it only dates back a couple of hundred years, not thousands of years. It was all an archaeological dig done in 1994, unearthed all these remnants of early 1800s buildings. Mainly it was the domain of a man named George Cribb. He was a convict sent out from England in 1808, being in possession of forged banknotes. He was originally a butcher by trade. Within six months of his arrival here in the colony, he was already advertising the sale of fresh pork. So he landed on his feet. Within a few years, he bought up all the land on this side of us to set up his slaughter yard. When they did the excavations in 1994, they found 500 cubic meters of animal bones. So he was a busy butcher. Uh -huh. But he was never worried about which side of the law he worked on. He was often in trouble for cattle stealing, illegal meat trading, forgery, bigamy. In 1811, he married one of the women who was involved in his original crime with him. They got married, having a great time, enjoying married life, until his first wife, who was still back in England, decided she wanted to come out here because he was being all so successful. So he had to get rid of his second wife, he bought her a ticket back to England, gave her 300 pounds, equivalent to 150,000 Australian dollars. She disappeared and he picked up his life, it was all completely normal with his first wife when she arrived here in the colony. The other thing was, they always suspected him of illegally creating alcohol, but they were never able to prove anything. Until 1994, when they excavated the well, which we'll head by, they found at the bottom of the well a small alcohol-making still. So he got away with that. Nonetheless, all his wheelings and dealings eventually came back to bite, and by 1829 he was completely bankrupt. The whole area was sold over to other developers. We then cut the little laneway through the middle here, Carrara's Lane, and they built all these tiny little terrace houses on it. They became known as mean terraces because they were so small. You can see the outlines here give you an idea of the size of the front of the houses. And then just a couple of tiny rooms on the ground floor. So a room and a half at the top at number one Carrara's Lane. Family, the two adults and then nine children lived for ten years. Sort of been pretty tight. Since then, they've built the big youth hostel over the top of it all. From <laughs> here, we can head along Carrara's Lane.
So, spectacle is always a big part of the rocks. Loggings, hangings were popular public events. If there was a divorce, it would go up on a public notice board so everyone would know. Eventually, the government thought it was a bit weird that everyone was coming to watch these hangings. So they moved them behind the walls of the police station down on George Street. But it was from around here that people were able to take advantage of the steep, rocky nature of the headland, look down into the backyard of the police station to still watch the hangings. So this area became known as Gallows Hill. People would cram in here to try and get the best possible view, and they'd get really angry and disappointed if the person on trial was given a last-minute reprieve and not hanged. But there was also the case of a guy named Thomas Moore. He lived just around the corner from here, but he never had very much luck with the French. In one case, he got into a pub fight with the Frenchman, who bit off the end of his finger and made it into the news. Then in 1844, he had a French manservant. They obviously had some sort of disagreement because the servant took to Thomas's head with an ax, killing him, obviously. The servant was like, what have I done? I've got to get rid of this body. So he tried to cram it into the fire. Thought that way it'd burn away, disappear, and it'd all be done. Really? It started to cook more than it did burn. So he pulled it out of the fire, loaded it into a crate, closed it down, locked it up, and he dragged it down to the boatman down by the harbour and said, Hey, uh, do you mind dropping this in the middle of the harbour? It's a bit of old rubbish, nothing too important. The boatman went to lift it up, but it was all a bit strangely heavy and it smelled. So he contacted the police. Police came down. Found Thomas's body, captured up the Frenchman, hanged him for his crimes. Thomas's body, though, headed over to the hospital and became a tourist attraction. Anyone who was anyone would wander by and check out this half barbecued corpse of Thomas. So thankfully, it's not there anymore, and we have other things to keep us entertained. But what are we this way? <laughs>
So it's like both at the same time. <laughs> See back to the Australian hotel. It's no tool because I can see thousands of If the English won the Ashes, the cricket competition, then the pub would be renamed the Brit. As luck or bad luck would have, the English did win the Ashes that year. So for two weeks in October 2009, the pub was renamed the Brit. Flags were changed to Union flags that are full menu of British beers, British food. Thankfully it's changed back these days, somewhere where you can try lots of Australian beers and where you can eat a few of our Australian native animals, kangaroo, emu and crocodile, but most famously on pizza. From here, we can head across around this way. As we do, you'll see the little set of stairs to the left. They're the stairs that take you onto the footpath of the Harbour Bridge. There's also a lift in the distance, but we'll head through the tunnel beside the stairs. As we do, you'll see on the walls lots of footprints. Literally, people wander through and stomp their foot on the wall to leave their mark. Feel free to add to it as well if you like. Then every few months they come through, clean it all off, and it begins again. Might make more sense as we wander through. It's a bit bizarre, but it's safe.
and all the northern suburbs of Sydney which disappear on and on and on and on. But back in the early colony, the Aboriginal people tended to avoid the new British colony, but Governor Phillip, who was in charge, really wanted to befriend the Aboriginal people, learn from them. But he wasn't having much luck, so he resorted to kidnapping Aboriginal men, keeping them under house arrest, dressing them in British clothes and forcing them to dine with him. They would pretty quickly, thankfully, escape, but over time, some of these men returned back to the colony to befriend Governor Philip under their own terms and in their own time. So one of these men was a man named Ben Long. He came back to the colony, he learned English. Governor Philip learned some of his Aboriginal language and had a little hut built for him on the hill which overlooks where the Opera House now sits. Hence, that whole area is still known as Ben Long Point to this day. Then in 1792, when Governor Philip's job here was done, he headed off back to England, and Benelong headed off with him. He spent the next couple of years over in London, but he didn't like the food or the climate, so he returned back here, where it was hoped he'd be an advisor to Governor Hunter and the British colony. But he felt really displaced with how much it had grown since he'd been away. So he ended up living out his days across over on the north side of the harbour with his wife, Barangaroo, and in charge of his tribe. So, down at the bottom of the hill on this side is a big area of land which is now known as Barangaroo. So the two sit on either side. But then here we're on top of what's now known as Observatory Hill, but was previously known as Windmill Hill, literally because they built a windmill up here. It was meant to be one of our first steps towards self efficiency here in the colony. Except as soon as they built the windmill, the convicts stole the fabric from the sails, it stopped spinning and started to collapse and fall down. So by 1804 they thought, alright, high point in the colony, windmills didn't work, should build up. Alright, let's build a fort. Not to protect ourselves from ships coming into the harbour. They wanted a fort up here to protect ourselves from 400 Irish people who were already here in the colony. So in 1798, there was the Irish uprising in Ireland. 400 of the people involved in that captured up. They thought the best way to punish them would be to send them all out here to Sydney, to a colony of 5,000, half of which were already convicts. So as soon as the Irish arrived, they sensed an opportunity for another uprising. So the government moved them all out to an even smaller colony further northwest and started building the fort here. Within six weeks of them starting to build the fort, there was an Irish uprising. It was completely contained out west, so it never affected the central colony. So they kept building the fort for the next three years, but with nowhere near the same enthusiasm. They only ever finished three of what were meant to be six walls. So it can't have been all that effective. And 
on top of the walls they finished, the guns and cannons they put up there didn't point out into harbour, they pointed back into town. Still scared of the Irish? By the 1850s they knocked down one of the walls so they could build the observatory which you can see standing there now. Now, the little yellow time ball up on top is designed to drop at one o'clock each day so people could set their watch by it. But that feature of the building was obviously more important than it being an observatory because the little observatory dome in closest beside can't see all of the sky. So 20 years later they signed up to a big project to help map the whole southern sky. They had to build the second dome so that between the two they could actually do this. So these days the building is kept uh, as a museum to its history and telescopes but they're doing a bunch of heritage renovations and restorations uh, so it'll reopen again sometime later this year. From here we can leave the view here we'll wander back down around this one.
nearly had to have a chance as well. Uh, it's also accommodation, yeah. So here you can see across the road the, to the Lord Nelson Hotel. It's another of the pups fighting over the title of technically being the oldest. <laughs> but they've gone for a different approach with their sign by saying they're Sydney's oldest hotel rather than pub. They have the oldest surviving building for a pub. Building dates back to 1836. But it was built as someone's house. Grand one at that. And then it was converted into a pub and hotel by 1842. So maybe that's the best claim, even if it wasn't built specifically as a pub. Certainly it can lay claim to being the oldest pub brewery or microbrewery. They brew lots of their own beers, have funky names for them like Nelson's Blood. Maybe worth trying. But then, back beside us, you can see this area of greenery and trees. This is Argyle Place. It was always a popular place for gangs to meet. Popular place for Ben up with boxing matches. The Rocks Push, which I mentioned back in the Suez Canal. They would always crown their leader through a bare knuckle boxing match. In one case, a 21 year old young man took on the existing leader of the push in a bare knuckle boxing match, which lasted 71 rounds before it was broken up by police. You have to wonder where the police were before that, but nonetheless, the 21 year old young man was given the moral victory for the fact he'd survived that long, but either way, it's completely nuts. And from here, you can head across around this way. As we wander around, you might see some little signs saying, don't block the rocks. Keep an eye out for them, and I'll talk about it in a couple of stops time. So. Yep. Yeah, yep. Uh, no, these are the closest to the bridge. Yeah. yeah. So there are. There's, they're not even open at the moment, so it doesn't matter. Like there are, you can walk further around into the city and take other sets of stairs down, but because of the elevate vessel which is on at the moment, um, the rest of the walkway is closed in that direction. But you can walk across the bridge, yeah, yeah, and then you'll come to the stairs that we just walked. Yeah. But they're also the ones closest to the Brit Lake. Uh, no, it would take you around behind Circular Key. So I don't know whether you saw like the roadway above Circular Key train station, Public Express A. That is. Uh, yeah, you can follow that all the way around, which kind of takes you to the Botanic Gardens, almost pretty much. Um, but yeah, that's also what's being used for the festival at the moment. So, very close to traffic. Yeah, yeah walking across the bridge is nice. Also, in behind the park, it's nice. And it's a place where it went right to the Secret Garden. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay, good. Good. Yeah. 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 
that much. said to look out before the sign saying don't block the rocks around here that comes back to Barangaroo which I mentioned before but we can also kind of see from here you can see the crown tower and the uh, taller buildings out to the left being built uh, that they all sit on southern Barangaroo northern Barangaroo is a big completely man-made headland park uh, and then central Barangaroo is currently a big construction site uh, they're building a metro deep in underground uh, but that's what the uh, protest is about, about what goes Thank you. 
So, here you can see across the back of the Walsh Bay walls, back in 1900 there was an outbreak of the plague which led to the deaths of 103 people. Admittedly though, only three of these people were from the rocks, but because the plague had started around here, the rocks were seen as this vile, disgusting place that had to be cleaned up. So, the government bought up the whole area and started cleaning up the area by fumigating buildings and demolishing them. By 1914, they'd managed to demolish at least 159 historical buildings. They also demolished all the original wharves which were in this area and redeveloped them by 1921. So they were then used as shipping wharves right up until the 1980s when more modern facilities came into being around other areas of the harbour which could handle much bigger ships. So the wharves here were left to decay for 10 or 15 years before being redeveloped into what we can see to this day. So they're mostly offices and apartments, but they're also home to the Sydney Dance and Theatre Company. So if you're into dance or theatre, that's the place to check it out. But then, down the bottom, you can see the little red car, which has been well and truly crushed. Don't worry, it's safe to drive around here these days. <laughs> 19 years ago, an American artist came out here bought himself a perfectly good little red rock. Second hand, silver. Found himself a large rock. Painted a face on that rock, which you might be able to make out from the right hand side. Then he took them both to in front of the opera house and proceeded to drop the rock on the car. <laughs> Art, I guess. Nonetheless, it scares anyone driving through here for their first time. So much so, they've installed street signs at either end to tell you that there's an artwork ahead. <laughs> From here we can head around this way. Oh, is it? Thank you. 
show called Restoration Australia uh, and the owners talked about the fact that they spent five million dollars buying the house and the same again renovating it what? which to me seems like quite a lot of money to live next to a train line but I guess they get a bit of a view as to we you can see out across the hub and see the ship leaving Certainly, it looks a lot different to how it would have looked when the first and second fleet sailed into harbour. Makes you think about what those journeys might have been like. The second fleet was one of the worst journeys out to Sydney because 1,050 convicts were sent out here and three businessmen were given the job of bringing them out here. So they loaded all the convicts. Wait a second, lovely place to live. They loaded all the convicts onto the ships in southern England and the businessmen were paid for the rest of the journey. So over the next six months as they all journeyed out here, the businessmen could spend the money on making sure the convicts had enough food, had enough water, were at least a little bit comfortable. Or they could spend their money on prostitutes and alcohol. I think we all know they're headed a lot more to the prostitutes and alcohol than they did looking after the convicts. So much so by the time the second fleet arrived here in Sydney, only 750 of the 1,050 convicts were still alive. And of those, only 100 were described as being in good health. The rest were sick or dying. They'd been locked away under the main decks of these ships in an environment that very rarely got dry. Plus, they had very little fresh food or water, so diseases such as scurvy were particularly prevalent. So, I'm really hoping your journey to Sydney was a lot better than that. But from here, we can head back down around over this way. Is it still raining? Yeah. Okay. Keep this up then. Oh, right. oh, Brad. oh there, that's bad. Mm -hmm. something happened. Just stop being that dramatic. I'll be as dramatic as I want. to move the whole pub out of the way of the bridge when the bridge was built. I think a little to its disadvantage. Hindsight, they would have chosen the other side. Uh, it is to note though, because they've got a little outdoor terrace up the top. You'll often find people waiting there for their friend who's doing the bridge flying to one divide, so they can grab a photograph of them that's cheaper than the one they sell on the bridge line. Honey? Then, on the end of George Street, beside us here, the dangers to you historically weren't only other humans, gangs, there was also a pack of dogs which worked around here. They'd chase down horses, pull them to the ground, riders and all. 
Lots of little kids are only saved by very friendly and helpful passers-by who grab them away from the dogs. Then there was the case of a guy named James Thielen. He got really, really drunk one night. So drunk he passed out in his front yard. Didn't even make it through the front door. Only to be woken up the next morning, having his nose being bitten off by a pig. But thankfully, livestock is less of an issue around here these days. And back across the road, you can see this sort of green, grey box in against the yard wall. That's Sydney's last remaining pissoir, or public urinal. They used to be all over the city in the 19th and 20th century. That was the last one. It was offered up to museums and galleries. They all really, really wanted it. Apparently, though, us Sydney ciders, we wanted it more. So it was reinstalled here, works, but it smells. And guys, if you do choose to use it, I say watch out you don't give the bridge climbers a view because they go straight over the top of you and there's not much of a route. So watch out for that one. We'll head down. Firstly, above us, you can see this big amount of scaffolding. Hiding it behind it is a building which is called the Sirius Building. And again, it was more of the government housing that the government had been moving the residents on from. 
but it was also the focal point of the protests, in that the locals had been hoping that maybe if the government sold off the more valuable terraces and houses around the rest of the Rocks and Millers Point, maybe they could keep this as government housing. But the government announced in 2015 that not only were they not planning on keeping it as government housing, they weren't planning on keeping the building at all. They were going to open its sale up to expressions of interest from developers who would have free reign to demolish it and build what they liked in its place. Which then created another wave of protests from architects and historians who felt that at least the building itself should be protected because it's an interesting example of brutalist architecture of its time, 1979. Which, if you have any experience with brutalist architecture, you might find that fairly polarizing. Nonetheless, the government decided it didn't have any heritage value. So in uh, 2019, the building sold for $150 million. Uh, the developers are in the process of keeping it though. Uh, they'll add balconies to the front uh, and it extends further out in that direction but it's much lower so they'll add an extra 20 apartments on top of that. Um, so I think it's not the worst result out of it all. We still keep some of the history albeit hiding behind fancy balconies but either way keep it in your mind because I'll mention it again in a second. So as I was saying before, the government bought up this whole area of the rocks during the early 1900s because of the outbreak of the plague. By the late 1960s, there was a huge building boom going on all over Sydney. So the government thought, hey, we'd like to get involved in this. What do we own? Ah, 21 hectares, which is the rocks in Miller's Point. So it's still a lot of workers, families living around here. So the government lifted all the rents around here by 200 to 300 percent just to give people a nudge move along find somewhere else to live and they put out a plan for 500 million dollars worth of development now clearly the residents were not happy with this idea so they contacted the builders laborers federation who'd been given the job of doing all the work around here and said hey guys can you do something about this to help us out help us save our community and our houses. So in November 1971, the Builders Federation agreed and they put on what became known as a green ban. Just said, if you're part of the Federation, you weren't allowed to work anywhere in this area. So in 1972, the government brought in the bulldozers because they were part of a different union and they figured if they demolish it all, there's nothing to fight for anymore. But the Builders Federation had a chat, negotiation with the Bulldozers Union and the Bulldozers guys agreed to join the Green Band and join the fight. So then the government had to get anyone they could pay to demolish stuff. But all this did was create protests and every Builders Federation member who was working on construction anywhere in Sydney walked off the job. So construction all over Sydney ground to a complete standstill. So eventually and humiliatingly in 1974 the government had to give in to the residents plan for this area of much more revitalization and restoration rather than their own plans of mass destruction and redevelopment and redevelopment of this area with brutalist concrete high-rise that would have looked a lot like the apartment block hiding behind scaffolding above us. So in 1974 the Builders Federation lifted the green ban on this area and all other little green bands they'd put on other areas of Sydney. Partly because they worked out they'd cost themselves the equivalent of 20 billion dollars worth of development. But also partly because they'd been taken over by a new leader who was later put in jail for taking bribes from developers. So I'm thankful all the timing worked out the way it did because they prevented the area from being covered in concrete high rise. And instead, they saved the little laneways, terraces, pubs, which we've wandered through and passed and over over the past hour and a half. So on that note, we've come to the end of the tour. I hope you've enjoyed it and that if you have, you'll leave me with what you thought the tour was worth and have a great rest of your time here in Sydney. So, Thanks so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you.